Today's speaker, Clifford Johnson, uh, was born in London, spent part of his childhood on the Caribbean island of Montserrat, finished his education in London with a BS degree from Imperial College in 1989 and a PhD from the University of Southampton in 1992. His first postdoctoral position was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, which I mention only because at the very time he arrived to take up that position, I was a sabbatical visitor there as well. So Clifford and I have known each other since the fall of 92, uh, and I've been very pleased to interact with him frequently uh, since then. We've never collaborated together, but we've had many uh, productive discussions about physics. One thing I want to say about Clifford is that from the day that I met him, he has been very creative about thinking not only how to advance the science, but how to communicate advances of science to the general public. And you're going to witness some of that uh, this evening. After the postdoctoral position in Princeton, uh, he went on to another one in Santa Barbara, uh, faculty positions at the University of Kentucky, the University of Durham in England, and in 2003, he moved to the University of Southern California, where he's had an opportunity to engage in the public perception of science and scientific topics uh, in various ways, interacting with filmmakers, uh, people producing television series, and on various kinds of panel discussions uh, uh, as a, a representative of how to describe science to the public in a way that's both honest and clear, which is extremely difficult, I can tell you. Uh, uh, so uh, tonight, he will uh, his talk title is a graphic talk about the universe, uh, right there, and I give you Clifford Johnson. Thanks, Thanks David, for that wonderful, uh, uh, very generous introduction. Uh, thank all of you. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming, and uh, uh, thanks to the Aspen Center for Physics for. Uh, inviting me and encouraging me to give this uh, talk. I um, hope everything goes smoothly. We had some projector problems earlier, so if, uh, if it happens again, I will juggle or something like that to try and entertain you. Uh, this talk will be perhaps a little bit different from what you're used to here in that I will, of course, be talking about science, but I will also be talking about the business of talking about science. So there's a little uh, sort of self-referential aspect to this talk as well, because I'd like to take you on a journey um, uh, with me, uh, come with me to sort of think a little bit about how I thought about this thing that eventually became this book and, 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 uh, and, and why I did this and, and why I think uh, <laughs> using the methods that I'm going to talk about, uh, I'd like them to be a little bit more mainstream than they are right now. Um, and I hope you'll agree with me at the end. Uh, that uh, that would be a good thing. So, but first of all, let me say a few things about the mission. And this mission is probably common to uh, many uh, scientists you've heard for, uh, heard from before, uh, giving giving talks to the general public. Um, I, I have in my mind uh, this idea that, of course, uh, science shouldn't just belong, quote unquote, uh, to us scientists or to some uh, small uh, select group of uh, science nerds or what have you. I really think it should be part of uh, everyone's uh, vocabulary. I really uh, spend a lot of my time working towards what I, what I call putting science back into the culture where it belongs. So I really imagine people out there in the world, in cafes, at bars, uh, at nightclubs, or wherever, uh, talking about all kinds of things, as, as they do, whether it be politics or uh, the latest TV show or what have you. And in that mix, I hope there's also some science. And so the whole business of the conversation is something that I'll, I'll be coming back to a lot. And uh, so that, that sort of is the vision. And I spend a lot of time doing that. And many of us spend a lot of time doing that in various ways. And uh, so that can be from maybe giving a talk in a museum uh, or, uh, or, or a public talk like this. Uh, and, and there, of course, as a scientist, you have a huge amount of control over the material, and you have uh, you know, a reasonable, uh, thank you, uh, audience. Um, 
uh, you, can, you can sort of change the variables a little bit. You can uh, perhaps uh, appear on a TV show, as I sometimes do as talking ahead, and maybe do some demos or what have you. There you're working with some filmmakers, and you hope that they don't twist what you say too much. You have less control, uh, but you reach a much uh, wider audience. Um, what I also spend a lot of time doing is science advising uh, behind the scenes, the various movies, big blockbuster films, which uh, means that I have even less control over how much of the science I give them is used, but of course you can reach uh, a massive audience, right? Um, just uh, two weeks ago, Avengers Endgame is now the highest grossing uh, film in the history of film, and it was nice to be able to be um, the science advisor there, who uh, or one of two that, that helped them out with, with some of their ideas. So, uh, so that's sort of the spectrum of things we, we do. Uh, but today I really want to talk about uh, something that's sort of in between, I think, and that's books, where I think you can reach um, uh, a fairly large audience with any luck, uh, and you still have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of control. So the idea uh, begins with, you know, a picture of a book. I, 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 before I say anything negative, I uh, should let you know this is uh, an extract of one of my own books. Uh, and uh, uh, books are great. Words are wonderful. Um, one of the things I was struggling with since the late 90s was the fact that uh, you know, people would ask me, uh, when are you going to write your popular level book? Uh, and and, uh, and I, I, it didn't feel like an urgent thing uh, that was needed. Uh, from me. I felt that um, there are some wonderful books out there. There are many, many wonderful books out there, and they continue be to be produced. Um, but I felt that we weren't really o uh, offering a broad enough spectrum of kinds of book for the kinds of audience that are out there. Um, and not everyone wants to read a book of this sort, uh, which is essentially you're getting the expert view uh, from a particular point of view, and it's essentially a monologue from the author. So that is a wonderful thing, I, I, I should say that, but I, I, I feel that that isn't for everyone. Um, and uh, it also doesn't give you opportunity to do certain things that I'm going to explain uh, to you in a moment. So I, for a while, began to think about whether there's anything I could bring to this whole business of writing popular level books that would, that would, that would be a, a contribution beyond uh, another one of those, those, those books. And uh, very early on, a certain idea came to me, which is that we should maybe change the point of view. Um, it would be nice to have a book where it isn't just the author's voice, there are multiple voices. And so the idea of celebrating those kinds of conversations I was telling you about, that I believe happen and certainly should happen out there in the world, what if we could actually have uh, uh, you, the reader, essentially eavesdrop on conversations about science? And that could be a very interesting way into the book and will afford various kinds of opportunities to do things that you don't do with a single voice. And then, of course, I realized that um, this is an ancient form that, at least in my field, had largely been forgotten. Um, and that is the dialogue form that you're familiar with from, uh, for example, uh, well, Galileo famously, but even then he was resurrecting an even more ancient form going back to the ancient Greeks. You may or may not know that uh, Galileo's uh, celebrated ideas about, that revolutionize our understanding of the solar system, our place uh, in the universe, um, those were actually presented in, in essentially the popular dialogues, uh, the, the popular books of the day, uh, um, uh, and they were in dialogue form. And so in some sense, the idea was to resurrect that old form, uh, but instead of having you know, people uh, you know, dressed in togas on a mountain or something like that. They would be in contemporary uh, settings. But the key thing is that you get multiple voices. You get voices that don't always agree. And uh, they can really unpack an idea in a, in a different way uh, than, is, uh, than is commonly done, at least in my field, in, uh, in, in uh, general level books. So that was the idea. Nevertheless, um, even though I had that idea back in 1999, 2000 or so, I actually didn't actually uh, go and, uh, and make the book. Lots of exciting things were going on in my field at the time, and I was distracted by you know, trying to contribute to that. Um, but the idea remained, and every now and again, every, every uh, six months, a year or so, I'd pull the idea out and, uh, and think about it again. And one of the things that... Uh, I thought would be interesting to do would be to have at the end of every conversation, back then it was still very much a prose book 
in my mind. Um, uh, but at the end of every 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 chapter, you would see uh, you would see the scribblings that often happen in these conversations. People, you know, get a napkin and they scribble an idea, and it'd be fun to just have that as a sort of visual at the end. And that would give you an opportunity to show to, to show you some of the tools that we use uh, when we when we think uh, as as physicists. We we do think visually. Um, we write equations, we write diagrams, we, we, we draw metaphors and things like that. And often, that's often hidden away in, these, uh, in popular level books. You're told not to have too many equations because that'll scare the audience and things like that. So I wanted to actually break that rule a little bit at the end of uh, each, each, uh, each conversation. So that was the idea. But as the years went by, um, every time I revisited the, uh, the book idea, uh, that visual component began to grow. And essentially, the, the visual component sort of ate, um, ate the prose in some ways. And at some point, I realized, oh, right, that was just another example of the kinds of, you know, that's actually from a, uh, a blackboard, uh, from a, a technical talk I was given. You can see how visual it is. Uh, even if you don't understand what any of that is, there's a sense in which there's, uh, it, it is, we, we do reason visually. And somehow, we're encouraged to hide that away when we write uh, for the general public. Weirdly, it seems counter, counterproductive to me. So, so I wanted to, to have the opportunity to have more of that. One of the things that occurred to me on the way was, wouldn't it be interesting also if you could see the people having the conversation? We're intensely interested in other people. And you might actually find that because you're curious about who these people are, how they met, um, what might happen uh, uh, with those people, you might actually be drawn into the conversation that way as well. So that was sort of a fun device I thought would be really interesting. But then I realized that also has another powerful use to it, which is that you could see a variety of people who engage with science, not just the, you know, the, the, whoever the author is or what have you, but you're seeing a variety of people and a huge number of people uh, of different kinds engage with science. So let's celebrate that and let's have that up front. And then I could put them in places in the world. Instead of just being in a lab or in a seminar room, they could be out in the world. And that also has another great purpose, because you get to see that science isn't just taking place in some special places. It's taking place everywhere. It's out there in the world, and it belongs to everybody. So, so all of these things come together in a way that I found very attractive. And, uh, and then I realized, uh, ironically, even though I'd been, you know, as a kid, I read tons of comics and things like that, it didn't occur to me until very late in the day that, oh, what I'm doing is I'm actually, I'm moving towards uh, a, a graphic narrative. I'm moving towards a graphic novel, sequential art, sequential narrative, comics, whatever you want to call it. So once that hit me, it suddenly uh, became extremely clear. And then it became incredibly urgent that I just make the thing. And, and, and so that became, the, that became the project. So I got very carried away, as you can see, and <laughs> drew lots of things. And uh, you'll, you'll, I'll tell you more about the, the process by which I got carried away. So anyway, the book uh, eventually uh, appeared. Um, but let me, uh, what I'd like to do is tell you about the book and I'll tell you about some of the science uh, that takes place. And I also want to, as I was sort of saying, while telling you about the science, I want to tell you about why this way of talking about the science is, I think, a valuable addition to all the other great ways, uh, regular types of books and other things that people uh, uh, like to uh, engage with. So let's talk a little bit about the book. There's a key thing um, uh, I, I'd like to talk about uh, that essentially is going on on every page of any or almost any uh, graphic narrative, comic, or sequential art that you might see, whether it be stuff to do with the superhero genre, or whether it's to do with uh, the, the wonderful rise of, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, of biography and memoir that's happened in the, in the graphic novel world, or, or in the graphic nonfiction world. Uh, it's a weird term, but that, there's no better one so far. Um, Three things, three elements play, uh, play together in an interesting way. You have pictures, you have words, of course have not banished words, words are powerful things, and you have symbols. And the very interesting thing is that any one of those uh, things, uh, when working in concert with the others, uh, create a unique form that really is incredibly powerful, and I, I would argue is extremely well suited uh, to discussing, uh, you know, challenging, uh, nuanced ideas, whether it be in science or elsewhere. 
And they worked together in this way, put them together in this triangle to sort of show the sort of democratic way in which they work together. Interestingly, words can sometimes be pictures, pictures can sometimes be symbols, words can sometimes be symbols. They can play, they can change roles in ways I'll give you examples of. And then together, they all drive the narrative. If you, if you learn the art of how to do that, uh, you can then uh, hopefully uh, uh, get your message across. So that's really what's going on. And if you want to know more about that, I'm not here to give you a lecture about graphic novels, but there actually are some classic texts which you might uh, be interested in. Uh, very famously, uh, perhaps the most well-known is Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics, which is a wonderful book just about how to read a comic, which sounds like I know how to read a comic strip or what have you. But you read that book and you will see so much more uh, when, you, when you next go and read, uh, uh, whether it be uh, you know, the, the Sunday Funnies or, or some longer form thing. Similarly, uh, Will Eisner's book is a classic. I would say um, Hilary Shute's book, which came out in um, 2017, is, is, is destined to be a new classic. Uh, she, uh, there's some overlap with some of the earlier uh, books, but then she takes it in a whole different direction with new examples and all kinds of other aspects are unpacked. So I recommend any one of those three as a start if you're interested in this incredibly powerful form that's often just thought of as you know, stuff for kids um, uh, and uh, is still gradually um, or something to do with superheroes. But it, it, it's, a, it's a form in its own right that is incredibly powerful and has a, a, a long tradition. So in the book you will see, uh, uh, as, as I said, uh, conversations between people. And you'll see conversations between different kinds of people, as I said, uh, who are either experts or non-experts, and they're talking together in various combinations uh, in, ver in, in various of the chapters. Each chapter is, is a dialogue. And, um, and, uh, and you, 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 yeah, you look over their shoulder and uh, uh, perhaps pick up some, uh, some science. Uh, I, I, I then do what I, what I promised I would do, which is that I'm not ashamed then to actually have actual equations on the page that uh, uh, an editor would normally tell you do not put into, <laughs> into a popular level book. I think famously Stephen Hawking, when talking about uh, Brief History of Time, I think he said uh, he was told that uh, every, every equation you put in halves, halves the audience. So I think he had one equation. I don't know yeah. <laughs> he still did pretty, pretty well uh, in terms of audience. Um, uh, I, there are lots of equations in here. There's actually a conversation that talks about that. Um, uh, uh, this fellow here who's a scientist, they're at a fancy dress party, which is why they're dressed so weirdly. Um, and uh, uh, he actually talks about these, these, these beautiful equations. And, uh, and the person he's talking to goes, beautiful equations, really? I, I love science, but when you start getting the equations, it starts getting messy. And, and, and he goes, no, 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 what, you know, stay with me, okay? Um, this isn't how, uh, you know, th this isn't the only way you should treat equations. You shouldn't necessarily just run, run screaming whenever you see math, which is culturally how, you know, that's the tone we have, at least in our, our, our culture here and in a number of other places. Um, the idea there instead is to go, well, well, here's the analogy. When you go to an art museum and you look at a painting, you get what you can out of it. You don't know, uh, some of you may, but you, you may not be painters. You may not know the history of art. You may not know all the techniques that were brought to produce that painting. Uh, but that doesn't frighten you. Um, you get what you can. And maybe on the next visit, you get a little bit more. And, uh, or at least you kind of understand at least some of the message and maybe in the context uh, what, what that thing being there is supposed to serve. And uh, that's the idea in which uh, it makes sense to have equations um, uh, in our presentations about what we do because those are some of our primary tools. At the end of the day, uh, the analogy I sometimes use is that it's like writing a book about um, music practice without ever showing a musical instrument. That doesn't really make sense. And even though you don't play those musical instruments, you at least get a sense of what they like, how they might be used in various ways. So, so that was one of the things, I, one of the traditions I wanted to break with completely, which is this, this shame of showing our equations, showing the tools of our trade. So there are equations, and if you don't get them, it doesn't matter. You can just continue with the narrative. The narrative doesn't hang on understanding them. However, there is a chapter that actually explains how 
uh, many features of these wonderful things called Maxwell's equations, which, by which we understand, for example, what light is, um, and essentially all of our power generation and all of that that we use that underlies our technology um, comes from understanding the interchange between electric and magnetic fields. It comes from those equations, and they actually have a conversation where they unpack those equations visually and explain why those symbols have a visual aspect to them that can help you understand uh, how some of those aspects work. And there we go. Yeah. Oh, and it came back. Okay, I didn't have to juggle. Okay, so, uh, so, that's a, so that's an example of one of the elements. But there's, uh, and, and there are various other people. There's, there's uh, younger people, there's, uh, there's older people, there's people in, ver in various places around the world, uh, which again, I thought might be an interesting way of getting people interested because you sort of go, hey, I sort of recognize where this might be. Does anyone know where that is? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's actually uh, Angel's Flight, uh, the, a, a tiny mini railway, very steep railway uh, on Bunker Hill in Los Angeles. So uh, I, no, nowhere in the book calls out what any of these places are. You either get it or you don't, and I sort of, I sort of like doing that sort of thing. Okay, so here's a, a, much more, um, uh, a much deeper aspect of this whole enterprise that I'd like to talk a little bit about, and that is the fact that... Um, you can have several things going on at the page, uh, on the page at the same time um, that help talk about the science in a way that, uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples later on, but let me just show you this, for example. These two people are talking. So what do you have here? You have the real world, quote unquote, of the people in a space. Okay? And then you have that they're talking, so you have the text bubbles and you're reading what they say. But also, um, uh, you, can, you can also talk about some of the, uh, you can also show some of the abstract things they're talking about by actually having them appear on various surfaces or perhaps in a separate panel. So you have the real, the abstract, and uh, you'll see on other pages, they also can engage with their environment and, and, and that would be another level of, uh, of, um, of explanation going on as well. And then there's a third, how many levels have I got to so far? Three. There's a fourth level, which is the actual medium itself. I will show you later on. I can play with that as well, which can also communicate some of the, the ideas in ways that I think you'll find, I hope you'll find fun. Um, so g digging a little bit more deeply, uh, here, you know, someone is just engaging with the environment. They actually pick up a pen and paper and they're writing some equations because she's an expert and she's talking about certain aspects of, uh, of, uh, of the field. And, uh, and so there you see her hands doing that. Um, in this example, uh, you're seeing something else going on. They're actually talking about a very important idea um, that some of us think may be true about space and time at the quantum level. So some of us um, here, for example, at the center and elsewhere work on something called um, quantum gravity. It's trying to understand how space and time work at the quantum level. Right now we have a very good understanding of how space and time works due to Einstein. Since 1915, we've understood this idea, which I'm sure you've heard about, that space and time, uh, uh, gravity is, is, is instead uh, to do with the flexibility of space and time. It, it's in some sense, it's like a fabric that's sort of smooth and can be bent and twisted, um, warped. You've heard about warp drive, um, that sort of thing. And, and so masses like the Earth or the Sun actually bend space and time in such a way that when you do a straight path, it makes it seem as though you're attracted to it, but you're just following a path in that now curved space time. So we understand that very well, and a huge amount of our understanding about the universe um, uh, is, is conf confirms uh, how that works. But at the quantum level, there's this, there's this thought that actually uh, all of that picture breaks down, and that smooth, nice, uh, uh, gentle curvature of space and time breaks down in some way at the quantum level, which would be relevant for things like understanding the very early universe, the seeds of what became the universe that we live in and us, or inside a black hole, places like that. We uh, need to understand quantum gravity. And one of the ideas is, is that because of what we learn from quantum physics elsewhere, uh, the, understanding the other forces and matter and things like that, things come in little chunk, chunks molecules, atoms, things like that. And so maybe there, maybe there are sort of molecules of space and time uh, in this quantum description. She's been talking with whoever she's talking to about that idea, and so she picks up the glass of water and is thinking about that fluid aspect of space and time and sort of splashes it in her hand. But we know there's another description of water 
that is completely different from water. Uh, you know, it's the molecular description. No single molecule knows anything about uh, wetness or splashing or what have you. But somehow the collective effects of all of those individual molecules in that description, that quantum description if you like, gives rise to that smooth thing we call water. So that's the hope that uh, might happen also with uh, our understanding of space-time at the quantum level. Maybe in the very early universe we didn't have a smooth space-time, we have that sort of molecular description. So that's the idea she's, uh, she's grappling with uh, on, on the, in that panel. And so again, you get to see that dialogue between, uh, sorry, not that, 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 the, in the dialogue, you get to see that interplay between different ways of toying with the idea uh, that helps the reader uh, come to grips with it. This is one of my favorites. Uh, many of you, especially if you came to last week's talk, uh, probably know what that thing is in the middle. Feynman it's a Feynman diagram. Now, what I've done is I've taken a Feynman diagram and I simply put some comic panels on it. So if you, read, if you read comics, you know that you read it sort of like you read text. Well, there's this thing. You read that first, and then that, and then that, then that. And if you read it in that order, you'll also recreate what a professional physicist who's using a Feynman diagram would actually have. That's how they would read the diagram as well. There are other ways of reading it as well. You can actually run time in any direction in a Feynman diagram. But you know, let, 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 let's stick with that one reading. My point here is that if anyone ever tells you uh, that cartoons are silly and it's for kids or what have you, you should tell them that the single most unarguably most powerful tool in the history of science, which is the Feynman diagram, is a cartoon. Right? And scientists play with cartoons. And they use these cartoons in order to calculate things. And so when I, when I say the most powerful tool, I mean you can calculate with these Feynman diagrams to something like 15 decimal places of accuracy um, uh, the properties of electrons and other microscopic particles. And you can go out and confirm that with accurate experiments to that level of, ac of accuracy. And as Feynman famously said, and that was some time ago, it's probably even more accurate now, that's equivalent to specifying the distance between New York and Los Angeles to the, ac to the, to the accuracy of the width of a human hair. So that's how well you can calculate with these cartoons. So I love that you know, one of the most famous things in physics is actually a cartoon. And it's, it's an important lesson about how um, visual metaphors, visual codes can actually be incredibly powerful things for doing serious things. Uh, so the Feynman diagram, as I said, uh, uh, is used to understand a lot of atomic physics and subatomic physics and is the foundation for most of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what's regarded as uh, uh, what's now called sort of high energy physics. I'll, I was going to say a little bit more about that, but I'll skip, I'll, I'll, I'll skip a little bit. Let me say a little bit more about symbols. So um, remember I said that sometimes a picture can be a symbol and a symbol can be a picture, what have you. So here's an example of a symbol, you know, especially in this context, right? If I show you a tree with an apple, you immediately think gravity, gravity Newton, right? So in some ways, this entire thing is a symbol telling, you know, I'm talking about gravity. You see that on the page, right? This, as, we said, as I said before, the Feynman diagram is a symbol here. I've added in a couple of other things. I put a little cross there, which means I'm getting something wrong. And this is really the story, uh, uh, part of a, an important story about trying to understand the quantum theory of gravity by starting with Feynman diagrams um, actually ends up running into trouble. Um, and so although we understand all the other forces of nature uh, that we're aware of uh, by Feynman diagrams, particles exchanging uh, between other particles in order to mediate forces, which is what the Feynman diagram does for you. Um, when you try and do that with a thing that called the graviton, which is what that G is, um, it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to work uh, so well. You need something else. And, and that leads you to other approaches to quantum gravity, which I won't really talk about much today. But certainly, uh, this is an idea of uh, how symbols are uh, communicating uh, that idea. Uh, here's another symbol, right? This is certainly sort of saying, okay, I'm now going to work in my, my notebook and try and you know, figure out what the answer is, right? Big question mark, what's the answer? I'm scribbling, I'm trying to work things out. So with those sorts of things, uh, those are examples of what I'm talking about symbols. Here's another uh, very important symbol as well, um, which one can use. And this is, uh, this is an idea that comes from some approaches of uh, quantum gravity, which is the idea that maybe uh, the dimensions of space and time that we see uh, may not be all there are. And uh, so, uh, you know, you have this sheet, which is meant to represent our, our, our three spatial dimensions. 
And just for simplicity, I've only put two of them here, and that's a person sitting there. And then there's an idea that maybe if you were to look closely, you might see an extra dimension, another sheet, where maybe there's a, a, a other, other structure. Okay, and the symbol there is that, of course, you're not going to do that with a magnifying glass, right? That's probably a whole program of experimental physics involving um, uh, powerful uh, uh, colliders like the Large Hadron Collider, which are, in essence, um, our most powerful microscopes because uh, by colliding at high energy, you also probe very short distances. And, um, and uh, so, anyway, the point here is, is uh, again, how I can use uh, symbols in order to illustrate uh, and explore and interrogate some of these ideas. Let me, uh, let me move on uh, to another uh, concept, uh, science concept, and also talking about the concept I'm using to explain the concept. And that is uh, something you've heard a lot about, I'm sure, which is theories of everything. This, this idea that there's this sort of final theory that we may all be working towards, and one day we'll find it, and we'll, it'll, it'll answer everything. It'll be the final set of equations, and it'll answer all the science, and then we go to the beach, and we're done. Okay. Uh, not everyone agrees that that's going to be the way things turn out, and some would argue that they're not the least because there's um, no precedent in the history of science for that, that maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that, you know, there are alternatives we should explore as well. Um, uh, this, uh, this person's talking about it, and uh, she's certainly pushing back against that theory of everything idea in the following way. She's sort of saying, you know, you have a theory of everything, right? Here it is in this box. So again, that's a symbol, okay? And, but really, it should, it should be the theory of everything, and then you look on the side of the box, it says, so far, okay? And the idea is that um, any particular working theory we have is in some sense a theory of everything for that domain of things which it has been built to explain. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, you can ask questions, the right kinds of questions, and that theory and that framework will give you uh, answers. But you could argue that there will always be the case that there are, f there are answers you can ask of that theory for which that framework uh, does not have uh, answers. Okay, a nice example is the standard model of particle physics, right, which is this, uh, essentially you go into uh, any, any physics department around the world and you will find a poster, uh, maybe looks a little bit like this, this is a sort of hand drawing version of it, and it lists basically all the particles we've discovered and what they do and how they interact and what have you. It's really our sort of proud statement of this wonderful program of physics uh, in investigating uh, Come back. Yeah, investigating uh, how everything is made. And what you'll uh, probably have heard is that actually uh, pretty much everything you see in this room is made up, uh, talking about the matter now, is made up of uh, you know, electrons which are around nuclei, and those nuclei are made of certain kinds of quarks, which are called up and down quarks, and also there's a streaming through you right now, or also these things called neutrinos, which are sort of cousins of the electron. And that collection of particles I just listed essentially make what's called a family. And you can imagine basically our universe uh, just made up of this family of particles, um, uh, our observed universe so far, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and that would be just fine. You just add in gravity and you're done. But strangely, the standard model, um, because we discovered them, uh, the standard model has other particles. And if it, essentially they form a very, very similar looking family. Uh, that's exactly the same, but just a bit heavier. And nobody knows why. And actually, if you dig a little deeper, uh, you'll find that there's another family, and it's also just that bit heavier. So there seems to be this sort of rhyming or repeating that's in the standard model, but the standard model itself cannot explain why that is there. There's no, there's no question you can ask of the standard model that will tell you um, why there are three of these families. The signature that there are three families will show up in places in the standard model, but it could just have been four or ten or an infinite number. So that's an example of a theory being complete in some sense, but when you ask certain kinds of questions, uh, uh, it, it's incomplete. So she talks about that and she says, well, you have that theory of everything so far, and then in order to proceed asking questions, for example, why does our universe seem to have uh, uh, dark energy, which may be something that's called the cosmological constant. Why is the value of it the way it is, which is a big question right now. You need a bigger framework. So you put it into a bigger box. 
And that's the theory of everything for now, right? That's on the side of the box. So, so and her point is, uh, and it goes on to discuss that and sort of says, well, it, you know, th eventually you'll do that again. That'll go into yet a bigger box and you keep doing that and that process may go on forever, which is perfectly fine because each of those boxes is still intricate and beautiful and maybe, you know, wonderful and dazzling in its wonder uh, of how nature works. Um, uh, but isn't necessarily a complete thing of, it, of its own. So that's a discussion uh, which, I, which, I, which I hope you might uh, enjoy, uh, which employs these tools uh, uh, to, to, to get across those ideas in perhaps a way that um, you, you, you haven't seen before. There's some other things that are fun to do, uh, which can also be instructive. Uh, I, I, I like sort of using all the tools to hand. This uh, uh, pair of people are having a conversation, and they're actually talking about one of the many ways which you arrive at the idea of the multiverse. This goes back to the Everettian idea, going back to um, discussing, trying to understand uh, how quantum physics works. And, and, and as you may know, a, a lot of the ways of thinking about quantum physics uh, are, are probabilistic, and you, you have a, maybe a 50-50 chance of something happening, and you can't say definitely uh, which happens, but you can, you can apply, uh, you can calculate the probabilities. And then it happens uh, that, it, that that choice happened, and then, okay, that's fine. That, that was the probability of that happening, and it happened this time, maybe uh, another time it happens the other way. Uh, some people said, well, maybe uh, they both happen, but you're only ever in one universe where one choice happens, so another universe sort of branches off. Um, uh, people, uh, it's an old idea, and people still play with that idea. In fact, there are modern revisitings of it. Uh, there are ways of combining that multiverse idea with some of these other multiverse discussions that happen. And anyway, these people are talking about the multiverse. But I thought it, it, it's, it's also nice to be able to have the environment resonate with the conversation. So it's a little on the nose, but uh, there's this branching that's going on as you're looking down on them, the, the branch that's in the way, and that's resonating with the branching they're talking about in their conversation. So that's another way of sort of uh, trying to, to, to do something fresh on the page that helps cement the ideas in multiple ways as you're, uh, as you're, as you're reading. This one, uh, this way is... Uh, 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 sorry, this is another example that um, I actually thought was uh, rather important to have because one frustration I do have with a lot of the books that we produce in our field is that there isn't enough discussion of how we do theoretical physics. There's a lot of discussion about the, the cool results and ideas and so on and so forth, but um, you, you could be uh, forgiven for thinking that we're magicians of some sort and we sort of just come up with these things and, uh, uh, magically. But um, there's a methodology that we mostly all use um, in some way or other. And it occurred to me that the perfect analogy for that is actually doing jigsaw puzzles, which I think most of you probably have done. When you do a jigsaw puzzle, what do you do? Well, you open the box. Or maybe if you're unlucky, uh, uh, someone lost the, lost the box, so you don't even have the picture of what it is you're trying to actually construct, but you, you go in there anyway and I'm gonna do this puzzle, right? And that's sort of where we are. We don't have the picture, but we have the puzzle pieces, or at least we have some of the puzzle pieces, okay? And what do you, what's the first thing you do when you, when you start doing a jigsaw puzzle? Uh, before, before, before edges. Yeah, you start turning them over, right? Yeah, so you start turning them over. So that's sort of step one. Okay. A lot of theoretical physics is just turning over and just looking to see what's on those puzzle pieces. People spend entire careers just <laughs> turning over a piece and discovering a new piece. Okay. And then, yes, you look for special cases. So someone said edges. Someone said corners, right? Those are special cases. They, 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 they have extra information because of their shape about where in the puzzle they might lie. Okay, um, so you, uh, and then you might also go, oh, right, all of these are blue, so maybe that's going to be the sky. And then later on you realize some of them is the reflection in the lake, but at least your first working hypothesis is that it's the sky, right? So you start making hypotheses based on matching things. That's classification. It's a huge amount of theoretical physics is just classifying examples. Just, so you f sometimes find we're doing really crazy seeming things and, and, and m working out models that don't seem to have anything to do with the real world and you go, oh, those theoretical physicists, right? That's because what we're doing is we're trying to understand how things might be the same in order to, to get a, a, an understanding of this region of the puzzle. 
and so on and so forth. So, so there's a whole conversation about the, uh, the, the jigsaw puzzle. Um, but then I thought, while she's talking about that process, why not also make the frames, the panels themselves, instead of the usual panel shapes, have them be jigsaw puzzle shapes? The jigsaw puzzle shapes point you in the direction to read this, which is a sort of non-traditional direction around, around, the, uh, around the page. And then she talks about sometimes, you, know, sometimes uh, you get stuck. You use the wrong piece, and then it doesn't fit. Right, so I actually do that with the, with the actual panel pieces as well. So now I'm using the actual superstructure of the form itself uh, to also drive home some of the message of what's being talked about. The, the, what I'm trying to get across here is that um, uh, there's so many additional opportunities you have when you're not just doing words on a page. Um, you have an incredibly uh, powerful set of tools um, which you can use to, to uh, talk about ideas. And then you can just have fun with crazy metaphors, right? So this actually is part of a discussion between these two people about uh, something that's called um, symmetry breaking, uh, which some of you may have heard of. One of the things we've learned about our universe over the years is that uh, as you go back to earlier and earlier in the universe, it actually was much simpler. It was much more symmetric. Um, and uh, so instead of like being a crumpled ball of paper, which is all jagged and sort of very complicated looking, uh, you know, it's like comparing that to a perfect sphere, which, you know, you keep turning it and it looks the same in all directions, so more symmetry. The universe itself, the laws of physics and the structure of the universe go back far and far enough, uh, actually becomes much more simple. So simple that, in fact, uh, stuff like us, life, uh, complex molecules, things like that, uh, could not actually have existed. Um, uh, in that simple state. You actually need to dirty the universe up a little bit. You need to break that symmetry in order to, to have, um, to have uh, 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 the structure that is, that is us, to have an interesting place. And so the, the analogy they wander off in, uh, she, she, uh, she, she starts that part of the conversation, um, uh, is, is uh, you know, that's, that's really what Paradise Lost was about. Right? Um, uh, Satan actually discovers how to break symmetry and mess up the universe, and he's cast out um, uh, by the angels, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a sort of a fun uh, analogy. So you know, that's, that's, just, that's just playing with an analogy. So you can do that as well and, uh, and, and go a little bit crazy with the visuals. But the point, uh, the point is that uh, it is an incredibly powerful medium with which you can engage uh, people with uh, all kinds of uh, uh, interesting ideas, uh, perhaps as a not, uh, as I said, there's nothing wrong with the other ways of doing things. Uh, this is a complement to that. In fact, I should say that at the end of every chapter, uh, I, I think one, what, what, what is one of the most valuable aspects of the book is the fact that uh, I have notes to then send you to some of those traditional books. Because obviously, I can't tell you everything. I don't want to have uh, the pages to be too dense. Um, and uh, you're jumping into a conversation, so no one is giving this sort of pedagogical lecture starting from, you know, the dinosaurs. So you're jumping in, you'll hear concepts uh, that you won't necessarily, just like in a real conversation, you won't necessarily understand what that is. So you suspend disbelief, get to the end of the conversation, and then when you go to the end of the chapter, uh, there might be some notes going, oh, on page 42, you heard about quantum field theory. Here's five books that are really great. And, and so, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's a complement to uh, uh, the existing uh, wonderful literature that's out there. One last thing I should say about conversations, before talking a little bit about, you know, art and things like that, is that um, the uh, other great thing about using conversations is that conversations don't really have a signpost saying, this conversation is about this topic. Conversations necessarily sort of ramble on a little bit. They go off in different directions. Different tangents occur. And uh, I actually really like that because it means you also get the opportunity to show how ideas are interconnected. Um, uh, it might start off uh, about one particular topic. And by the time you get to the end of the, the chapter, uh, they're talking about something completely different. And they've visited all sorts of other bits of science as well. And uh, I, I, I like that about conversations because we tend to also uh, compartmentalize ideas and science uh, a little bit too much sometimes. So uh, uh, the, the conversation, the dialogue, is a great way of breaking down some of those barriers. Let me say a little bit about, um, about, uh, about the business of me actually making the book. Um, I, I, I wanted to see if I could uh, uh, 
uh, do the book myself as, as both writer and, and artist. And it certainly wasn't clear when I started. Uh, I, you know, I was merely, you know, like most people, sort of a casual sketcher, um, uh, occasionally do a sketch, don't do another one for years, uh, maybe do a face and you always do that same face, that, you know, your go-to face or what have you. That's not good enough to, to do uh, uh, what I needed to do for this project. So I really needed to teach myself um, the, the, the art technique. So th th there's no substitute uh, for just practicing, 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 but intentional practicing, really observing um, what you need to know more of and, uh, and, uh, and, and practicing techniques and things like that. And I, I should say, um, uh, it's a wonderful thing to just get into the habit of having a pencil and a sketchbook with you wherever you go. Even if you're not intending to draw a graphic novel or become uh, an artist of any kind. Uh, because by looking at things and, and trying to figure out how to draw them, you actually see the world anew. I really recommend it if you haven't, uh, you know, people often go, oh, I don't have the kind of brain for sketching or I don't have the kind of brain for science or what have you. I, I, I largely believe that's not true. I think people have far more uh, capabilities than, than they give themselves uh, credit for, uh, but you have to practice uh, like anything else. And uh, so, uh, but I, I strongly recommend sketching. It's, it's one of the cheapest uh, uh, hobby. The ratio, you know, in terms of the amount of reward for the amount of equipment you have to buy, um, it, it's got to be up there in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a couple of uh, 50 cents on a pencil and uh, you're off. Um, so uh, anyway, so some of you who came early may have seen a gallery uh, that was up of some of these drawings. So I will, I will skip through relatively quickly. Um, but this is all just examples of me practicing over the years. Once I decided to do the book, um, I, I was just obsessively practicing every opportunity from people, human anatomy, uh, faces, uh, um, buildings, which very forgiving because they don't move. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, grabbing faces on the subway, not literally, but you know, yeah, drawing them. Uh, and then practicing different techniques. This is you know, me practicing how to do brushed ink and things like that. And uh, uh, perspective, going crazy. With draw. I love doing hand-constructed perspective with T-squares and what have you. I also use digital techniques. Sometimes I'd like to, you know, I would map that out, draw that based on a real cafe that was. And then I would build, rebuild the whole thing in three dimensions in a computer so that I could uh, rapidly move around and get different views to make it more interesting on the page. So I, use, I love traditional techniques, but I also use digital techniques as well. Um, there's uh, some sort of traditional techniques going on there, but I also did things on the iPad. This is an example of just, you know, I went with the family to, uh, to, uh, to the beach uh, and uh, had my sketchbook and, you know, just get a little sketch in while they're dipping in the water. This is done on an iPad on the subway. Um, and so on and so forth. Process. People are very curious about the method by which you actually create a graphic novel. Do you write a bunch of words and then you just draw the scenes? Or do you draw the scenes and then decorate it with words? Um, I find the, the ideal process, at least for me, was uh, a hybrid of those two where you're actually, where you get to the stage where you're actually writing uh, and drawing at the same time. So this is, for example, a thumbnail this uh, thumbnail was actually maybe about an inch and a half across. I just blew it up so you could see it. I just sort of doodling in a corner. Uh, the scene involving this, this little boy watching his mother cooking. And uh, he, he realizes something about the cooking that leads to a, uh, uh, an idea for doing an experiment. And, um, and uh, that's the page it eventually became. This actually is one of my favorite stories. People usually go, so where's the string theory and the quantum gravity in this story? It's just some kids talking about cooking. Um, actually, it's all of science in that story. He observes a thing. He goes to his sister, has a conversation. They come up with a hypothesis about why you get way more rice than when you start, right, with cooking. You've, you all know what, what the answer is. And uh, they, they come up with an idea for how to test it, and then they test it, and they confirm or, and, and reject various hypotheses. It's all of science in microcosm. And uh, I, I sort of... Um, I, I think it's extremely important to remember to illustrate the process of science and not just always the gee whiz facts uh, that uh, we always want to hear sometimes. So anyway, so that's an example of something that was written by working with the thumbnails and having the actual story in my mind at the same time. 
Um, and, and, and that was, I think, some of the best uh, process. It was also, um, early on, I think there was a lot of time when I sat and wrote prose and then later on thought about what the pictures would be. But I, I found that ended up being a, a little bit clunkier on the page than when you're doing it all together. But it came with experience. I was learning on the job. Uh, this is an example. People often associate comics and sequential art with superheroes, and of course they're completely different things. Um, uh, but I had to have a nod to the superhero genre. So there's, a, there's actually a fun opportunity to talk about the whole business where uh, some of you who know the superhero genre will know that a lot of those famous superheroes actually started out as scientists. And then there was an accident in the lab, <laughs> and they had powers, and then they went off and to fight crime. And I actually think rather more of those scientists than, than, uh, than you think would actually just continue doing science. <laughs> and so, so the, people, the people talking about this actually go, well, what, what would be the best power to have from your ex accident that would help you then do your science? And uh, so indeed, you know, you're, you're scanning a sample or you're irradiating it with some device or but maybe you now can shoot beams from your eyes. So it's a sort of playful uh, discussion, but it's my nod to the superhero genre. In fact, it's the first story in the book. So you open the book and uh, you see people dressed in superhero costumes uh, and it completely confounds what I was saying about, no, this is not anything to do with superheroes, but it starts with superheroes and then you rapidly realize they're at a fancy dress party and uh, they start talking about Maxwell's equations. Um, <laughs> so anyway, moving on, um, if you actually do want more superheroes in science, um, this is a prose book, but it's a wonderful book by um, uh, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Kakalios, and he actually unpacks uh, his, his view about how, what the science would be underlying a number of sort of famous superheroes' powers. So it's just a plug for Jim's really excellent book. Um, okay, uh, I'm not sure when I started um, and, uh, but I think I should probably start getting close to uh, some sort of wind down. So let me try and uh, say a couple of more things. This is another example of something that was pretty much, I made this, this part of this page uh, uh, um, up uh, visually before I even wrote anything else. And, and so there's a bit of the rough there. And this actually was part of a conversation about the mathematical ideas that we come up with in science uh, or in just doing mathematics, are they really out there in the universe or are they just these idealizations that exist in our minds? And to what extent can you find them out there? And they're talking about that. And one of the great things about having this visual tool is that I can just have him explore. So they actually talk about the idea of a perfect circle. There's the equation for a perfect circle. And uh, he actually just explores a perfect circle by just sort of walking along and meets better and better, this is actually a double page spread in the book, better and better circles as it goes on. Again, it's another e example of how you can have the abstract, the real, and, uh, and, uh, and the conversation all work together on the page. One of the key things that makes comics very, very different, from example, uh, for, from, say, uh, movies, and people often think of comics as movie stills. It doesn't help that there's a lot of famous movies out there that started as comics. Um, uh, they're not movie stills. Um, when you look at a comic page, uh, the person doing at least as much work uh, as the comic creator is you, the reader. You're actually actively engaged in bringing this stuff to life. And, and so that's something I like to take advantage of. You can look at this page and you can come to it in different ways. You can come back to it in different ways. You can read things at your own speed and combine things in different ways in order to get meaning. And that's something you don't do with a movie. It's just going, it's going, it's going, it's going. You know, okay, you could pause and stuff, but that's sort of different. Um, okay. Usually when uh, you get someone who's an expert in one field go dabbling over in some other field, people go, well, did that help you discover something amazing in your own field? Right? That's usually, and people want this anecdote where they say, I discovered this amazing thing because I was you know, fly fishing or what have you. Um, and uh, I, I don't have a story like that. Um, sorry. Maybe I will one day. But this is slightly tongue in cheek, but um, I have discovered an important equation. Uh, and the equation is comics equals physics. And let me explain. <coughs> um, the point is that, and this, this resonates with what I was saying, it's a little bit more of what I was saying earlier. When you look at these three panels, which actually happen on a, on a page in the book, and you see this person, well, mostly you just see the green, so she's a symbol for the purposes of reading this. And you see it's not so great in this light, but you see her there, 
you see her there, and then you see her there. And you are immediately constructing two things. You're constructing space and you're constructing time, right? Uh, you're doing that. I'm not doing that. So, right, this is what I mean by you are an active participant in the reading of, of, uh, of, of making, giving meaning to the stuff. So comics um, have a sense of time uh, in these stills. Uh, you create a sense of time and you can also create uh, space as well. And physics, right? Space and time, right? It's, it's, it's the bedrock of physics is all about space and time. So what better subject to discuss um, than space and time in the medium of comics? And so, you know, when, when that occurred to me, um, and, uh, you know, the, the business of uh, being an active participant and the sense of time, or what have you, that's well known in comics literature, etc. But the fact that it's really adapted to physics is something it occurred to me because I was trying to do physics with this. And then I realized that I have to play with that. Okay, so you've already seen a little bit of that play as well, but um, oh, oh, this was just another example of you know, watching time go by uh, in the sequence you read that. She's doing different things as she's preparing the food. Um, but I get to play with things. You remember that idea I was telling you about quantum gravity? Somehow space and time break down at some level and become granular in some way we don't understand. Um, well, you can communicate that rather nicely by having the space and time structure of the comic, which is, of course, the panels. The panels themselves begin to as dissolve as they're talking about it in this, part, in this particular story. And it dissolves that, those, those blobs that she spill over into another page, and that discussion of the quantum nature of space and time continues. Um, so you get to play with that a little bit in a way that may not be apparent uh, uh, to, on a first casual reading, but maybe as you dig deeper. Um, I, I like to create stuff that allows you to read multiple times and get new things on every visit. This is another example. From what we know about Einstein's, um, from Einstein's equations, the interior of a black hole, and this is provisional because Einstein's equations are believed to break down probably as we get to the interior of a black hole, as we get, certainly when we get to the quantum physics of uh, gravity. Um, but provisionally it says that space and time start doing weird things as they go inside a black hole. For some examples, they, they actually change roles. What's time becomes space, what space becomes time. But anyway, it starts going, it starts becoming counterintuitive. So I actually play with that in one discussion where they're talking about a black hole and the swoop of the paintbrush actually reads you around, gets you to read around in a non-traditional way. So time is running the wrong way for a comic as you go deeper into the black hole. And, uh, and use, again, that sort of using the environment and the form to resonate with the, with the actual meaning uh, that the different, uh, that's going on in the conversation. Okay, I, I think it's probably high time I stopped. So my hopes then are really that, that uh, you agree that this is a, 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 you know, a valuable uh, uh, additional way we can, we can engage with ideas um, uh, and uh, certainly the conversation is something I think really should be celebrated more. I hear people talking about all kinds of amazing bits of science uh, in all kinds of unexpected places. And uh, I, I, I wanted to celebrate that. I hope you do that uh, uh, out there in the world. And, uh, and uh, I, hope, um, I hope this way of, uh, of explaining ideas, uh, which I think has much more potential than I've, than I've even touched on, um, uh, continues. I hope uh, the you know, publishers and authors and uh, uh, non-scientists as well uh, join in uh, this way of trying to bring science to, uh, to everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Is there a little time for questions, yeah, perhaps? So. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Ah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, well, the, the, I guess the Marvel stuff that, that came out this year actually, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a lot of fun discussing, uh, slight spoiler uh, for those who haven't seen Avengers Endgame, um, uh, uh, various time travel uh, options, which ones uh, would be fun to use and which ones to uh, perhaps stay away from. And so that was fun. But that was actually th three, or, uh, almost three years ago. Um, more recently, it does seem that people are very interested uh, in using in art of various kinds, whether it be film or uh, other narrative um, books, etc. People, uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot more time travel stuff than, um, than I've ever seen before. So uh, 
there's any number of time travel shows I've, I've, I've been advisor on and uh, books and things like that. And, and so sometimes my challenge is to try and help them not just do the usual time travel tropes, but maybe uh, figure out what problem they're trying to solve narratively, if they'll let me, and then try and give them maybe a, a slightly fresher way of doing things. They don't always listen, but uh, so, so the challenge there sometimes is uh, often to uh, get the, the filmmaker or artist or what have you um, to, to realize that if, if they just go that extra mile, it will really help the, uh, the, the thing they're trying to do, their storytelling goals. My, my, my goal is always to help their storytelling goals, not just to tell them, you did that wrong or what have you, which I don't think is very productive. Um, but it can be challenging sometimes to get them to realize that. Yes? Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I do indeed um, uh, give lectures of that sort. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry if you came expecting one uh, of that sort and got this instead. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're very kind, thank you. Um, uh, uh, now I'm going to sound like um, that character from The Simpsons. You may have seen me on, uh, or what's that, what character is that? I don't remember, but anyway. You, uh, if you look on, um, uh, you will find uh, on Nova and uh, The Universe, which is a show on the History Channel. So that there's, yeah. l there's lots of me doing that too. So you might, you can find them on YouTube or, or even buy them from the, <laughs> 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 yeah, yes. You had mentioned the concept of multiverse. Is there a generally accepted uh, description or idea of a multiverse? No. What is it? No. Oh. There are um, so many different ways of, of arriving at a multiverse idea, some of which are sometimes accidentally uh, and sometimes deliberately conflated. So you'll have, for example, the quantum multiverse, the idea that the universe is splitting every time there's a quantum mechanical choice, get mixed up with other choices to do with uh, scenarios that arise in cosmology. And uh, so they're, they're, they're really, I think it's a, it's a very loose um, idea um, uh, which has some very precise representations and different approaches to understanding our universe, um, but those, those are all not necessarily the same. So um, I think the one that people uh, actively, uh, perhaps in the context of cosmology, think about most um, uh, is inspired by the fact that uh, we have good experimental confirmation that our universe had what's called, instead of just the Big Bang, which is this hot, dense early phase of the universe, a sort of pre-Big Bang phase where it did something called inflation. And it did this rapid, incredibly exponentially fast uh, um, acceleration in size before it then went to the regular expansion. Um, the models you write down um, uh, uh, you know, using actual equations to model how inflation work. If you look at them, they, they, um, they mostly all tell you that there are many more options besides just this one universe, right? The, the mechanism that gives rise to this bubble that becomes our universe, there's, there's, there's no natural way that that's the only bubble it produced. So it's like you have a glass of beer and uh, there's certain conditions that will happen that will make um, a, a bubble form in that beer. Um, but you don't just get one, right? Once those conditions are right, you just get bubbles of different sizes all over. And so that is one area that people go, ah, while we don't, you know, no one's saying we have any experimental evidence for a multiverse, but the, the mechanisms we understand best for giving rise to the universe that we understand now also suggest on the page that there could be uh, other universes with different laws of physics and what have you. But, it, you know, it's, 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 it's highly speculative. And um, you could argue that it's no more, it's no more um, real than uh, writing down an equation for your finances and finding that there are all kinds of other solutions besides just the one that says you have, you know, $50,000 or what have you. There's, you know, minus $50,000 because you could square root, but you don't, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> equations can be misleading if you take them too seriously without guidance from nature. So, yeah. Uh, yes, I think, and, and, and then, yeah. Well, what is real is climate change. And I was, is the community coming together and using very graphic images of the real world? Mm -hmm. 
to explain how dangerous it is? Um, I, so I, I think that, um, so right, this is on the theme of uh, using this powerful tool to communicate urgent and powerful ideas. And I, I do believe, I can't think of any examples right now, um, uh, but there, you know, there, there are uh, authors in various fields. Um, uh, I don't know if there are any scientists involved, um, and it doesn't need to be, uh, but um, it would be nice if there were collaborations involving scientists to somehow maybe also bring the science into that discussion. Um, there are wonderful, there's a wonderful graphic novel, for example, about Katrina um, called, um, oh gosh, it's by Josh Newfield, but I can't remember the name of the book. Oh, AD, After the Del Deluge, which is a, a great example of looking at, you know, using visuals to show how catastrophic uh, uh, a big storm um, can be and things like that. So, so. It's scary, but you can, you, can, you can use comics to either accentuate that scariness in, in certain heightened ways that can be useful, um, and, uh, or you could use it to sneak an important message without scaring. It's a really powerful tool. So, yeah. So maybe I'll take one more question and then. Uh, No. <laughs> um, I mean, no, in that I, 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 I didn't really know any others. And uh, um, uh, I, I learned very early on not to talk about the idea because there was really nothing else like it. And so people just kept telling me what they thought the idea should be. And, and that just pollutes. When you're trying to do something completely new, I, find I, I just can't shut that out. So I just stopped telling people what I was doing. Um, but the wonderful thing about any project like this is that the web is wonderful, the World Wide Web, the internet, what have you. Uh, and, and, and so there are artists out there who, who put up their own methodologies, they, they put up their samples, and it's just so informative just to look at other art. So even though I wasn't necessarily talking with anyone else, um, just seeing uh, someone achieved a certain thing and then I'm spending time trying to figure out how they did that, uh, and of course, I, you know, I, I grew up reading comics, of course, so I went back and revisited some of those classic comics and appreciated certain artists and then started figuring out, are those artists now doing, do they have websites and then following their stuff? And, and so you just learn, you pick up, you borrow, you steal, or, you know, the same with uh, any, any uh, and I learned a lot. I now do know people in the, uh, in, in, in the comics world a little bit, um, more writers than I do uh, artists, but but yeah, it's, it's a wonderful community, uh, as, as it seems like you might know. Yeah. Well, I, no, no. Oh, okay. Did you have a favorite comic strip growing up? Oh, gosh. Um, I read a lot of superhero stuff in the, in the sort of 70s and 80s. Um, uh, I, I got less interested in the sort of big stuff that was going on, and I liked some of the smaller characters like Daredevil and what have you so from Marvel Comics. And uh, I was, a lot of it attracted me, a lot of the art at the time attracted me. Uh, artists like David Mascicelli, who's, who's this, it's just amazing artist, who's now um, actually has a, this wonderful uh, non-superhero book called Osterio, Osterios Polyp, which is a masterpiece all about architecture. And, um, but anyway, uh, so I followed a lot of, you know, I was interested in the art even then, although I wasn't trying to do it, I just, uh, Gravitated towards certain, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, sure, and you know, and you know, like the X Men and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot more superhero stuff than I think. I really discovered the non-superhero stuff once I grew up uh, like into. Sorry. Like Watterson. Oh right, of course, yes, yeah, yeah, and um, and then later on, uh, just um, you know, some of the very celebrated graphic novels now uh, that we we all revere quite rightly. Um, uh, I should probably stop. Uh, um, uh, I believe there's a pile of books out there. If anyone's interested in me signing one for them, uh, come by. <laughs>